so guys, thanks for joining. We're very happy to have uh, Jordan Max, Senior Software Engineer at the Nervous Foundation, and Cheng Wang, uh, Founder and CTO of Alephium. Uh, I added that he's a Scala master, but a lot of other things on top. And Hong Chao is uh, joining us. He's a core dev at Elefium, and he will answer some of the questions. We'll have a wide-ranging exchange on proof of work, tech subjects like sharding, UTX, or cross-chain interoperability. But we'll also fly higher with a discussion about decentralization, what it achieves, and how to get there. And we'll also let the magic of the conversation just take over sometimes. So I want to first thank Jordan and Michelle for a flawless and pleasant organization on the nervous side and Marina on our side, which has done that perfectly. I hope it has been a, such a, a cool experience for you too, Jordan. And I suggest that... Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Yeah. I suggest that here we go uh, directly. Like, we are here with two different audiences from two different blockchains. So I think the first thing is to really introduce, introduce yourselves. So Jordan, it's a, let's start with you, Jordan. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, your Twitter bio says you're a senior software engineer at Nervos and that you love Rust. It also says you're an OG in crypto since 2011 and that you have many interests in life from crypto, coding, tech, health, and meme. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Since when are you with Nervos and what do you do there exactly? Yeah, sure, sure. So a real quick background on myself. Um, I've been writing software ever since I was a teenager. I spent my early career working in various startup companies, primarily web 2.0 companies and mobile application companies. Uh, then in 2011, I, I joined the Bitcoin community after hearing about it and began contributing to that. But uh, back then, you know, it was much smaller space, much different than it is now. We didn't really know if this crazy blockchain idea would ever actually catch on anywhere. And there was no min money in the industry. So I didn't immediately drop everything and just shift all my efforts directly over there. I was starting a business and I continued on with my own business. Um, then a few later, a, a few years later, Ethereum came out and I realized this was really the start of something bigger. So it took a couple of years, but by 2016, I'd, I'd begun to completely shift all my efforts towards the blockchain industry. Um, then I, I, the Nervos Foundation, I joined them in 2020 as a senior software engineer, and I'm currently working in the developer relations department. Um, my goal is to facilitate developer growth on the platform, which that translates to a lot of different things. Some days I'm writing code, other days I'm writing standards and documentation or assisting other uh, development teams with building on the platforms. And some other days I'm not writing code at all. I'm writing articles, making videos or speaking like I am here today. Thank you. That's quite an introduction. So you really have lived a few different lives already in crypto. And that's, that's really cool. Um, can I ask you, Cheng, to present yourself too? Uh, the Alephium audience knows you pretty well now, but the Nervous Committee doesn't. So for those who don't know, can you share a little bit more about yourself? What's your itinerary in life in crypto? And what's your day job at Alephium? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen. I'm the core of RFU. My past two blockchains started in 2013 when I started my PhD in EPFL to research on consensus algorithm. And back then, I, I think consensus algorithm was not really a thing. And I did not even heard about Bitcoin back then. And I was doing pure uh, theoretical research. Uh, and in 2015, I proposed the, the first million times asynchronous by dynamic consensus algorithm, uh, which was a big uh, theoretical result. Uh, and uh, at the same year, I started to hear more about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, especially uh, uh, Vitalik, they uh, found my paper online and then uh, they can contact me and uh, invited me to um, talk about my algorithm in, in, in the uh, Ethereum Foundation. And that's how I get um, kind of into the crypto space. Uh, and then I started follow the development of blockchain. Uh, I created it out of here in 2018, trying to build a, a scalable and a secure blockchain uh, for uh, the apps with a new algorithm called Blockflow. Uh, and since then, I pretty much focus on uh, it full time. Uh, in besides crypto, in general, I'm a very technical guy. 
I I do coding and math in my spare time as well. So uh, pretty much a boring boring person. I would strongly disagree with this, <laughs> Cheng. <laughs> but uh, I should also have asked the question a bit differently. What's your day and night job? Because that's actually how much we see you working. Like um, I wanted to ask Hong Chao also. Uh, to present himself briefly, but I think he has a little bit of a trouble to actually request speakership. So we will come back to him a little bit later, if that's fine with you guys. Uh, so that's cool. Thanks for introducing yourself. Uh, now I want to know a little bit more about the, ner the, the blockchains you're working for. Like um, Jordan, can you introduce us about Nervos? It's been around, it's been around for a while now. But can you tell us a little bit like what it is, where it comes from, and from when? Yeah. Um, so you would think after me being with the Nervos Foundation for three years, this would be an easy question to answer. But for me, it still actually isn't. Every time I try to give the elevator pitch, it turns into a 15-minute discussion. So I'm going to do my best to keep it brief. Um, so Nervos is a platform that's born out of a necessity for new solutions for many of the, the problems that exist on smart contract blockchains today. It places a, an emphasis on long-term sustainable decentralization and security, um, whereas a lot of the platforms today, they've achieved smart contracts and, and Jordan. Achieved decentralization. Yes? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I, I, I could okay. hear you. Yeah, did you hear any of the beginning of that? That's that's funny. I've just I've been talking for the last minute or two here, and nothing's been coming through. Okay, so l let me start all over again. Um, so, Nervos is a platform that's built out of necessity uh, for new solutions to many of the problems that exist on smart contract blockchains today. Uh, it places an emphasis on long-term sustainable decentralization and security. And it uses a multi-layer design to attain the scalability portion of that. Um, flexibility is another cornerstone of the platform um, of its design, and that's uh, which it allows smart contracts to execute on a RISC-V-based virtual machine, which is actually emulating RISC-V real-world hardware, uh, which means that the smart contracts that are executing are, are basically executing on bare metal at the lowest possible level, which gives the most, the, the maximum amount of flexibility possible to the developer. Um, and the reason that it's doing that is this enables it to adopt new features in the future, in the future um, faster uh, because there are actually less limitations to the platform. So I believe that the development of the platform was started in 2018 and um, the main was uh, launched in 2019 and it's approaching the first halving. It's, uh, it, it halves every four years, just like Bitcoin does. And that's going to be in late 2023 this year. Oh, Brad, um, it seems we cannot hear you anymore. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm really now. sorry. I have a connection problem. Uh, uh, so I'm, I, I don't know where you were. Did you finish uh, telling the story of Nervos? Yes, I, I did. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody was able to hear that. Um, we're, we're no stranger. We've used Twitter spaces for a couple of years. And it, this, is, this is unfortunately the regular scenario where half the people are not functioning properly. <laughs> so anyway, we'll just have to do the best to get through uh, it. Thank you. Like it's it's one of our first. We've had like a few already, but like uh, yeah, it's a it's a bit of an experiment. I'm I'm really sorry for this. I hope it's going to work well now. Uh, so now that you have introduced Nervos, and I've I've read quite a bit about it. So I think now, Ken, could you introduce Alethium, please? Um, yes, so Alephium started as a, a project to try to uh, solve the sharding, uh, the scaling problem of blockchain. Um, uh, as you know, that's the Eastern Foundation, they have been working on the sharding um, and the scaling problem since 2000, I think uh, 2015. 
and they uh, initially they came with a very complicated proposal uh, and a very ambitious goals and and I was following it for quite a long time and uh, was not really happy about the approach uh, because it's it's just too complicated and I personally really like the uh, the simple and elegant approach uh, uh, by Bitcoin. So I started to to research um, into a kind of uh, a possible sharding solution that is more like Bitcoin design philosophy. And uh, that's how I came up with a new algorithm called Blockflow. Uh, it's based on the proof of work and, and the UTXO, uh, basically scaling Bitcoin, uh, but uh, don't really uh, satisfy the decentralization, satisfy the security, uh, the good properties of Bitcoin. So that's how uh, the project started. Uh, I, I started working on uh, it in full time since 2018. And then the project kind of started to evolve uh, from the very starting point. Uh, by, uh, initially, we mostly focused on doing sharding, uh, doing scaling, and then uh, as in 2019, uh, DeFi start to grow, and then uh, uh, we see the the huge potential of DeFi. Uh, so I also start to research into that direction, and turns out that the UTX model stuff is uh, a great fit for uh, building secure secure uh, applications on, on top of um, blockchain. So um, in 2019 and 2020, main, uh, the, the main focus uh, was all on the uh, virtual machine and uh, the app features uh, for RFM blockchain. So right now, I think we pretty much have done all of the core uh, design and all of the important uh, uh, technical uh, designs. So uh, in general, I feel like uh, RFM's main uh, uh, motivation and the main goal is to uh, build a scalable and a secure platform for this single application. And, and this year, we're going to prove that we have achieved it. Thanks, Cheng. Um, so we've, um, we've, we've read with great interest the latest dev update uh, published by Cheng on the Nervos Talk forums uh, about metabolism and this uh, crazy analogy that I think was very interesting and also very well illustrated. Can you tell us a bit more about your team and the ecosystem job and just to give you give us an idea of how much people are working and how is where you are now? Um, yeah, yeah, I can give a real quick background on that. So Nervos has five founders, are all of which are uh, blockchain veterans in the industry. Um, the chief architect is Jan C, who's a, a former Ethereum core developer. Um, and while working at Ethereum, Jan realized that there were a, a number of problems that he didn't feel were fully solvable without radically breaking design changes. So he actually ended up creating a brand new blockchain, which ended up being Nervos. So it's, um, Nervos is designed to be both uh, a technology and government, um, in bo both decentralized in technology and government. So right now, there are actually five or six separate companies that are dedicated exclusively to building out Nervos' technology um, and many more teams building on top of the platform, primarily through an accelerator called Build Club. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, on the, the, the network side, it actually has two layers right now. The CKB chain is layer one, and Godwoken is the EVM-compatible layer two. Uh, we also have multiple bridges to Ethereum and uh, many other chains. Uh, Godwoken has uh, branded itself as a game plus blockchain, which is actively focusing on the gaming market. And um, CKB, the layer one, is rolling out a bunch of new features and infrastructure this year, along with new tooling, documentation, um, and a, a whole bunch of new design solutions, which we hope it's going to make it a lot easier for developers in the ecosystem. Um, the last product I should probably mention is Axon, which is a brand new sidechain framework that's coming out. Um, it's, it's more for like application specific blockchains, kind of like Cosmo, so if you're familiar with that. Um, it uh, was recently, very recently deemed ready for production and it's being used by a couple teams that are building on it right now. So we should see the first products this year. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Jordan. And like, since now I think it, it's working, like, and I invite Hong Chao to give us an update on where we are at Alephium and like, tell us more about the Lemo upgrade. Uh, 
Uh, hey everyone, can you, yes. can you guys hear? Yes. Thank me? you. Perfect. Oh, great. <laughs> so I will, I will briefly introduce myself a bit. My name is Hong Chao. I'm a core dev at uh, Alephim. Um, I'm generally fascinated about the asymmetric technologies, meaning that the technology that can um, sort of give um, some kind of a leverage or age to the weaker players or the stronger players. And that is one of the reasons why I was interested in blockchain in the first place. And uh, I want to see, I want to see like um, what kind of power we can potentially give to the ordinary people. Um, when it comes to Lemon Upgrade, it is the first network uh, upgrade in our history, like in Alephim history. Uh, we've been working on it for quite a while now and it includes many uh, important uh, updates to the functionality, security, and the performance of, of, uh, of Alephim. Um, it's kind of difficult to come up with a complete list of uh, all the things that we have changed. Um, but I can give you a few examples what, of uh, what Lemma Upgrade includes. So we have introduced a, a new set of VM instructions and building functions to make smart contract development more efficient. Uh, and that includes, for example, the dynamic array indexing, um, subcontract systems, which is which is like a more secure sort of a map data structure. Um, we also introduced the uh, building functions to facilitate, um, for example, debugging and uh, logging and so on. We also have introduced um, like new features, uh, both at the language and the VM level to make smart contracts development more, more secure. And that includes, uh, for example, a new assets uh, permission system uh, wh where you can basically uh, dictate what kind of assets and how much of the asset can be uh, used before you call a contract, uh, before you invoke a, a function call, a smart contract at the code level. Uh, there's also a, a system to check external calls. So like by default, uh, you need to be explicit about who can actually call a public method of a smart contract that can mutate the state of the contract. Uh, we do that because that's traditionally a source of uh, many security issues. Uh, we have also improved the node APIs and, and SDK to make the development of the smart contracts a lot easier. And that includes like coding, unit tests, integration tests, and deployment and so on. You can think about like Truffle and Hardhat, and the development experience is pretty pretty similar to that. To, to that. Um, so, with the Lemma upgrade, it, it enables us to build um, the bridge and uh, some of the prototypes for our uh, DApps, such as like like NFT and 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 a Dex. So these projects were not possible. Uh, before the lemon upgrade, or, or at least uh, like uh, significantly less efficient and more error prone. So yeah, so I'll stop here. Thank you, Hong Chao. Uh, so now that we've made the introductions, let's get into the debate itself, like and discuss a little bit some interesting topics we have in common. So for example, let's start with proof of work. Uh, both chains are proof of work, which is an unusual choice in today's, uh, let's say, uh, la layer one's uh, landscape. So it's not really cool or popular to be a proof of work partisan these days. So there must be strong reasons for anyone to build or contribute to build a proof of work chain. Can both of you, uh, Jordan and Cheng, can, can you explain why you chose proof of work when conceiving or uh, your respective blockchains. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that sentiment completely. That these days, uh, proof of work is is not the the uh, it's not seen as the green option. So we get a lot of flack. And and um, if I'm being completely honest, there was a point in time where I was concerned about it as well. But um, I no longer believe that that's actually the case, and that's because. It, when you look at the reality of what's going on, and especially looking into the future of, of where the technology is headed and what the innovations are coming, ultimately, the proof of work by utilizing energy in the most efficient way possible um, is, is the cheapest. And since it is a competitive platform, it naturally gravitates towards uh, green energy of all kinds. So I no longer see it as a problem. Um, and 
the reasons why we would select proof of work for our chain is is some of the most common reasons which are um it's it's absolutely the most well understood it's a very simple to understand type of system uh where you can really understand every detail about it whereas some of the other um things like proof of stake are actually very very complicated once you actually start looking at the implementation um and it's also very much battle tested as and we we've seen we it's the only method that actually has a, a long history behind it since bitcoin started with it in 2009 um, and our observations are that it's the, it is still the most decentralized uh, for numerous reasons. And when you look at what's going on with proof of stake today, there were predictions about its centralization, and especially with Ethereum, we're, all, we're unfortunately seeing those to be true. And, and I'm not necessarily bashing proof of stake here. There are definitely certain merits to it. Um, but when you're trying to create a, an ecosystem that is, that is truly decentralized, especially on layer one, it, proof of stake doesn't really seem like it's necessarily the best option for that. And so Nervos, we we have a lot of different options, a lot of different layers, and we continue to use proof of stake on the, the higher layers. But for layer one, we really saw there was no alternative here. We needed the the the, the absolute best. And um, at this point in time in history, proof of work is still the best. It's interesting that Joey Coin Michael Saylor when he said there's no second best but i think uh, we i agree with the sentiment and i would like to know what cheng do you do you have anything to add on the choice of proof of work versus proof of stake yeah that that's well said i uh, i want to add a bit more technical uh, pers uh, perspective so first uh, proof of work is really a very simple consensus algorithm uh, as jolan said it's very easy to read about, it has a long history, and also it's very easy to implement and uh, easy to validate. On the other hand, the proof of stake, you, it, it requires more CPU and network to, uh, to check the messages from the different validators. And also you need to have um, some on-chain resources to manage, to manage the validators. And uh, that cost is not trivial if you can see uh, running for node in a very large scale decentralized system. Um, a second, because uh, I think it's a shared, shared blockchain. Um, so, to uh, compare to the approach proposed by Eastman, they have a beacon chain and then they have to uh, manage all of, the, all of the validators in the beacon chain. And also, they need to uh, shuffle all of the validators to uh, randomly distribute the validators to different uh, shards. And that protocol is very, very complicated. Uh, but uh, in our field, we have block flow algorithm, and this does not need uh, a big chain. All of the blockchains, they can basically uh, uh, operate in a stateless mode. Uh, you don't need to know the state of the miners. Uh, that's the greater advantage of proof of work, uh, proof of work over uh, proof of staking. Um, so pretty much we have no choice. We have to use proof of work. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, last, I, I want to also echo uh, Jordan's point that uh, proof of stake is still very new and there are quite some uh, open problems uh, that we still need to uh, wait a bit more time to, to see how it evolves, especially the uh, network network effects of staking, which is very, which uh, I think is a uh, kind of a big trouble nowadays. Uh, is uh, even though like the protocol give people incentives to run for now, people don't run. People just really want to delegate the the stake to to some providers, uh, and this is not good for decentralization. Yeah, that that's all. Thank you, Cheng. Like um. I want to ask you both uh, briefly, if you can, uh, to detail a little bit like how your respective uh, proof of work algorithm works. So in the case of uh, uh, Nervos, it's called NC Max, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I must say that your docs are really amazing. Like I, it's, it makes it really easy to dive in the project. And then I would ask you, Cheng, to tell us a bit more about the proof of less work, which is a a different way of achieving the same thing, I think, but in a different way. So Jordan, can you tell us a bit more about NC Max? And I think I'm going to merge, like, uh, also, can you, in the same answer, tell us, like, what kind of TPS and what kind of block time uh, does it allow uh, NC Max? Yeah, sure. 
Thank so, you. Um, so NC Max, the NC part of that is actually stands for Nakamoto consensus. So it's actually similar to Bitcoin's Nakamoto consensus. It's based off of that, but it, it's been um, modified in certain ways to improve certain problems that Nakamoto consensus has. Uh, like the first one is that it actually uses a two-step process of proposing blocks and then or proposing transactions and then confirming transactions, which is used to improve the block propagation time, which helps prevent selfish mining attacks. And then it, the, the second thing that's much different is it uses a dynamic block time, which automatically adjusts to network conditions to give the shortest possible block time without actually compromising security at all. Um, so the the next part of that is like, the, what is the TPS? Well, because of the dynamic uh, block time, it can actually change up and down, but it generally runs at under 10 seconds uh, per block, um, which gets us approximately 200 TPS, uh, which is about 10 times of what Ethereum is today. And all of this is possible on while running on a Raspberry Pi device, just like Bitcoin does. Um, and that's uh, just L1. That doesn't include the other layers. If you include other layers, it's it, of course, it's much higher. It's, it's a similar approach in some ways to um, multi-layer and, and sharding actually work similarly in that, that approach is in that's how you actually increase the n amount of TPS. But uh, strictly speaking on just the layer one, it is approximately 200 TPS. Um, and the block size is, I believe it's 597,000 bytes, um, which is, it's a number that was chosen, which it's, it's the estimated amount to pack in 1,000 basic transactions per block. Um, so anyway, it's one of those every 10 seconds, and it, it, it ends up equating to what I had said before, approximately 200 TPS. What about you, Cheng? Can you tell, tell us a bit about proof of less work, the TPS, and the uh, block propagation and block time, etc.? Um, yeah, so uh, we use proof of less work to uh, mitigate the energy consumption of uh, the classical proof of work. Uh, so one of the observations is like, um, if if it's considered to be secure, you can uh, consume like uh, zero point one percent of the uh, electricity, global electricity, to uh, get a good security. Uh, uh, does it still make sense to spend uh, zero point three percent of the electricity for uh, for Bitcoin? So uh, I I personally think that's uh, 0.1% sounds uh, pretty much secure. The extra energy can be uh, avoided if we can design the protocol differently. So that's uh, that's what we do with proof of lace work. We shift part of the uh, energy consumption from the uh, physical world to the network, uh, to the internal network by burning coins, basically. Yeah. So it means uh, miners, they need to both uh, consume electricity and also uh, consume and also burn coins to mine new blocks. Uh, in this way, the cost still kind of the same. Uh, so the security is the same, but the uh, the total energy consumption is reduced uh, uh, a lot. So that's the proof of less work parts. And then regarding TPS, because we are sharded blockchain, it really, the, the final TPS really depends on the number of shards in the network. Uh, right now with, uh, uh, 16, uh, with 16 shards, and with very conservative parameters, we can uh, easily get to four to 500 transactions per second. And if in the future there's a, a huge demand of uh, transaction throughput, uh, we can increase the number of shots. And the uh, uh, block time, we right now the setup is 64 seconds. Uh, so uh, we try to find the balance between uh, very long block time and uh, very short block time because if the block time is very short, it means uh, the blockchain is going to have uh, a high often rate. Uh, for example, with each one with 15 uh, with 15 seconds block time, the anchor rate is more than I think it's more than 10 percentage. Um, so uh, we try to because we want the the protocol to be very uh, lightweight and efficient. Uh, so we choose a bit higher uh, block time than uh, 15 seconds. So we end up with uh, 64 seconds. And, but of course, longer block time has some uh, issues with the experience, but I personally don't think that's a problem because 
ultimately, ultimately for proof of work blockchain, the security is uh, about the confirmation time, is not about the block time. So it really depends on how many uh, blocks in total, uh, how how much works you in total. Uh, the uh, the transaction has accumulated since it's submitted to the to the blockchain. Yeah. So I think wallets and explorer can uh, really uh, mitigate this user experience issue. So that's that's how we end up with this um, uh, sixty four seconds. Interesting. So so. It's, it's two approaches to the same problem and uh, we're in the same kind of order of magnitude, but it's, uh, it's very interesting to see different ways of solving the same problem. I think this is very healthy for the space and I, uh, we learn from everything. Uh, now I want to ask you one more question about the proof of work uh, element of the blockchains is that neither Alephium nor Nervos are ASIC res resistant. Uh, and both have, let's say, an uncommon or newer hashing algo. Um, so can you explain first why you decided both to conceive of a, a, an ASIC-resistant blockchain? And uh, then maybe if we have time, we'll talk about the, the hashing algorithm. Yeah, so we we definitely did not want to um, make something that was ASIC resistant. Um, even though, as as somebody, I've done a lot of mining in the past, and I've I've had uh, mining rigs on both GPUs and ASICs, and and I can say that uh, from a hobbyist standpoint, I I'm actually a fan of GPU mining. I like it better, but there's no real good way to prevent the eventuality that ASICs come out and and generally replace GPUs, um, other than constantly rotating your algorithm. Um, so. Is, the important thing is to look at, like, with ASICs, is it actually bad? And from our standpoint, we actually think it might be a good thing because when you get specialized hardware built onto um, your ecosystem, it's really a show of support in certain ways because people are investing in hardware that can only be used on a single platform. So so that, that kind of goes hand in hand with using a, an uncommon or a unique hashing algorithm, uh, when you pair those two together, um, it's it's companies investing in your ecosystem for, to, pro to produce this hardware for it. And then it's it's uh, your miners investing also in your in your chain as well. And so they're much less likely to attack it because if they did so, they would render their hardware obsolete and it would take quite a bit of hardware to attack it. So it, it really doesn't make sense. And from that, that standpoint, we see it as a safer option. Um, to to allow ASICs to be on the platform, and um, and also to use a, a unique hashing algorithm. Cheng, do you have anything to add on the ASIC resistance? Uh, I agree totally with with Jordan, uh, and also uh, ASIC ASIC friendly has been proven by Bitcoin that it really works well in practice. Yeah. So nothing more to add. Okay, so let, let's move on to UTXO, actually. Uh, both projects also have that in common, to have like a variation on the UTXO flavor of accounting model. This is also not so common those days, as the account model seems to kind of have won the market of the accounting model exactly a little bit the same way than proof of stake seems to have overtaken proof of work. So can you uh, explain, each of you, uh, respectively, uh, the cell model for Nervos and the stateful UTXO uh, for Alephium. So, uh, Jordan. Um, you're right. So this this could be a pretty deep topic, but I'm going to try to keep it really, really simple. Um, in short, uh, when you look at certain things about the account model and certain things about UTXOs, they're very different in their structure. Um, but ultimately, what you're trying to achieve is usually very similar types of smart contract functionality. Um, so the biggest difference between um, the account model and the UTXO is the, the way that I've typically explained it to developers who are trying to learn it for the first time is the account model is closer to a, a single core processor and the UTXO is, is actually similar in some ways to a multi-core processor. And if you look at what's going on in hardware today, we all we all started in single core, and but now even your cell phone is is multi core, and every desktop processor is multi core. 
um, it's, it's necessary for scaling. And we see that same type of a thing going on with UTXOs, whereas the account model, um, it is very difficult to scale that because the state is, is one single element and it runs basically in a, a single thread, which means it's only single core. And while that's for the developer experience, that's actually preferred. It's, it's a much easier to work with. Uh, you end up with problems of scalability, whereas UTXOs being akin to something like a multi-core processor allows things to happen in parallel. So you can be executing multiple smart contracts at the exact same time. And this is something that really scales horizontally. And, and we see it as, as one of the main reasons that we wanted UTXOs is it, it, it really does scale a lot, lot better. And then there's some less um, some minor, there's some other things that are a little less um, apparent, which is also UTXOs, uh, because they're individual, um, they, can, they actually fit better for state rent a lot better than the account model. Whereas we know that Ethereum's had a lot of proposals out there for various methods of state rent and none of them are implemented. And uh, we, we don't actually know if they ever will implement something because it's very difficult on the account model uh, because everything is owned by a smart contract. And how do you divvy up the, the smart contract? But, it, but UTXOs, every individual state unit, little piece of data can be owned by an actual user. And because of that, that subtle difference there, it makes certain implementations of like state rent to be much, much easier. So um, even though they're less intuitive to the developers, just in general, UTXOs seem like they are a much better option for the, the future when you're looking forward to blockchain trying to scale globally to encompass all the users on the globe. Well, that's a really great analogy. I love it a lot. Like the, the single core, multi-core is a really interesting analogy. Uh, Cheng, can you talk to... Uh, Hong Chao actually wanted to talk to us a little bit about explaining Stateful UTXO and how, how and why we did these choices. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, many of the things that uh, Jordan said. Um, we picked UTXO because UTXO is a proven technology from from Bitcoin and it's very good abstraction to manage assets. And it's a immutable data structure. And for that, it's um, it's actually a little bit easier for us to 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 to, to do our sharding algorithm. Um, as you know, it's pretty difficult to, to have a sharding algorithm for, for a cut model because of the mutable state. And it turns out that UTXO is a pretty crucial data structure for us to implement the block flow algorithm in Alpine. Uh At a high level, UTXO, it has like inputs and outputs. So like transaction span inputs and uh, like span outputs and creates uh, span, like yeah, it creates inputs and then produce outputs. So visually it's established like a graph for, for all the transactions. And in the traditional like blockchain, unsharded blockchains, all those trans transactions are structured into one chain, which with a lot of uh, unnecessary dependencies because like the block after uh, the this current block, uh, those dependencies in these two blocks not, do not necessarily have dependencies to each other, but structurally, in this chain, it has dependencies to each other, each other. So these dependencies might not be like necessary. And the block flow algorithm at a high level basically find a way to structure like these graphs into multiple chains and uh, it manages all those dependencies in a, in a better way. That's, that's how we implemented the, uh, like our 16 shards uh, as we have right now in the production. Um, so, this is like number one, the UTXO is kind of crucial for us to implement sharding. And number two is that we uh, feel that uh, UTXO is, uh, thinks it's a, it's, it's a pretty good, it's a very good uh, data structure to uh, abstraction to manage assets. So it's, we, we actually manage the, the token in the UTXO uh, compared to like the Ethereum uh, uh, managed tokens in, in, in a contract. So token in Alpine is just first class citizen. Uh, we feel that uh, we have a like a better, like a deeper asset security uh, for, for tokens. And also like UTXO has like better kind of like, we, we it has uh, invariance for, for when it comes to inputs and outputs, so it's easier for us to verify uh, like in the transaction. And, and because of the input and output model, we 
some of the like some types of MEV is a little bit harder for us for uh, in on Elfin. Uh, like some of the MEV transactions, uh, like arbitrage and so on, it, it requires like multiple trans transactions uh, on Elfin. So it's a little bit difficult for the attacker to, to for the searcher to to basically execute this successfully of this MEV. Um, so yeah. But the problem with uh, UTXO is that it's a little bit difficult for, for developers to, to program since it's not very intuitive. Uh, and the cult model is actually a lot more uh, developer friendly. Uh, and and UTXO model also has a problem of like uh, concurrent execution, constantly like access the same, uh, like UTXO uh, at the same time. Uh, a cult model doesn't have that problem. So for us uh, to uh, we actually combine the UTXO uh, model and the account model so that we can take advantage of, of both. And, and so for the, so in the, in the combined step or UTXO model, we use the UTX models to manage, still we use the UTX models to manage the assets like the native ELF token, uh, the native ELF and other tokens. So the token transfer would have a much higher scalability and uh, but we use the common models to manage smart contracts, which has like a global state. And uh, those like smart contracts has partial scalability, but we can like uh, have like a lot higher expressiveness than the UTX model. So we have like our own VM and uh, our own language, uh, which uh, we don't feel that we sacrificed our expressiveness uh, when it comes to like programming the smart contracts. Uh, whereas, whereas if you look at the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin script is actually much more limited. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's Thanks. all. That is Thank it. you. Thank you. It's really, I agree. We could make a whole session only on UTXOs and uh, different design choices. It's really interesting. And that leads us directly to sharding, actually, because both chains... Uh, have that as a selling argument that they can scale and uh, whether it is at the layer one level or is it in general um, this is a strong selling proposition uh, in this market that you need to be secure but you also need to be scalable uh, both chains accomplish that very differently and um, i wanted to ask first um, cheng can you explain a little bit the approach to charting to sharding uh we're all like let's let's try to stick to short answers now so we can get a bit fast uh, to the end but can you explain the alephium's approach to char to sharding please cheng yes so uh Arvin sharding is based on new algorithm called block flow and block flow is based on proof of work and the uh, utx model as uh, we have discussed in the uh, um, earlier, um, so like uh, basically sharding is you have multiple blockchains that can process blocks and transactions in parallel, so you get the highest throughput. Um, but here, uh, all of the chains they uh, are similar to each other, so users they don't need to uh, uh, don't have the learning curve to adapt to a new blockchain, and and also all of the transactions between those blockchains are atomic. So um, compared to uh, other approaches, like you have one blockchain connected to another completely different blockchain, the, uh, the bridge experience is also much better. Uh, users don't even need to feel about it. Um, yeah, so that's uh, basically what we're doing uh, uh, right now. Uh, yeah. And Jordan, can you explain like uh, the, the multiple ways Nervos is doing sharding too? Um, yeah, well, we focus primarily on on using multi-layer, which is L2s, which is a, it's a, a different approach to actually doing the same thing. When you talk about what what are you doing for scalability, it's ultimately breaking up the data set. Oh no! Oh, here we're doing this again. Are we? Are you able to hear me now? Hello, hello. Yes, I I hear you very well. 
So okay. Yeah, I was, was doing that thing. I unmuted, started speaking, and nobody could hear yes, me. Yes, again. Um, okay, so... Um, so Nervos uses t L2s to uh, to achieve scalability um, instead of sharding, and this is similar. I mean, when you look at sharding and when you look at L2s, they're actually trying to do the same thing. They're taking the data set and the execution, and they're breaking it up between multiple computers. So it's it's really kind of a, in certain ways, it's a philosophical difference. Uh, like I can say, one of the advantages of sharding is that. Um, when you create multiple shards, they're generally pretty much identical in their environment, which is great for developers who want to move from shard to shard. Um, on the flip side, L2s have an advantage as in every single L2 does not necessarily have to be the same. They can have different attributes. And so um, when a developer needs a different type of environment for a project, or even if their, their existing project starts in one state and grows and, and, and changes over time, they can actually move between different environments that have different attributes to them. Um, so, and, and L2s in general is kind of a little bit more of a, a track record in, in history of being understood and working uh, very well. So it's when you look at the, the actual experience before the user, it's typically very similar type of thing. Um, you do use some type of a bridge interface uh, for both. And eventually, we hope in the future that these, these interfaces are actually simplified. Um, but um, yeah, Nervos went on the L2 route. I think it achieves pretty much a very similar thing. We can add many, many L2s on top of our L1 which in certain ways inherit the security of L1, which is the reason why it was so important for it to be uh, really decentralized and secure. And then if the L2s at some point in the future are so popular that they fill up, we can just add simply add L3s or even L4s to continue that scalability indefinitely. So that's the approach that Nervos has taken. Thanks, Jordan. So I'm, I'm going to speed read a little bit because I, I, I want to talk about governance and decentralization. Um, so... Nervos had his first hard fork last year, and it was really interesting to read in the metabolism update that you that Jenksy said the most difficult challenge was explaining what would happen after the hard fork to ecosystem players, since Alephium is going to have uh, his first uh, network upgrade in the next few weeks. Uh, which advice could you give us? Yeah, I could give you a, a couple pieces of advice on that. Um, well, first, hard fork is a, a scary term in our industry. So you need to reassure your community on what the real situation is and what the actual benefits are. Uh, I mean, we say hard fork, but in, re in more realistic terms, we're just saying it's a network upgrade. So just make sure that that message is very clear to your users. Um, also, make sure you get the word out uh, and to everybody who's going to need to upgrade and get them the updated tooling as soon as, as possible, because uh, we've learned the hard way that you cannot get your, your your teams out there from development teams to exchanges. You cannot get them to upgrade immediately. Um, they, it sometimes takes time, and oftentimes they're going to um, know well in advance, but they're still going to miss that deadline. So uh, you need to have contingency plans basically built in for that. Um, and then the third thing is you really need to leverage your... Wow, that was strange. I just got a really loud tone in in my ear. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Leverage your community the best you can to amplify your message to to um, development teams and exchanges because sometimes they just don't update and going out there and telling them, hey, you got to update or this is going to happen isn't enough. They actually need to hear it from their customers. Their customers have to come have to go out there and complain and say, hey, this isn't working because you didn't update properly. So that's the way that we have actually found is, is best to get these these things like exchanges to update when there are breaking changes um, because they don't they simply just don't listen to us we don't know why this is but they will listen to their customers so make sure that that message is getting out there thanks that's actually a really interesting tidbit and uh, well I, I, I'm sure we keep that in mind like that uh, to be honest we're also talking about the network upgrade because it we feel it, it, it reflects a little bit more what we're doing uh, and so, but that, this points out in general to a, a more, let's say, more general question, which is governance. Uh, based on your experience in crypto, both of you, this is a question for both of you, um, and also your experience in your particular blockchain, what, what is your opinion on the ideal governance and de decision-making system? Because at the end of the day, blockchains are huge governance experiments. 
Um, Cheng, maybe can you start with this question? Yeah, uh, this is a very uh, hard topic. I think is a kind of uh, research in progress. A lot of uh, different projects are still uh, trying and experimenting. So personally, I, I don't think uh, there's a perfect solution. And, and we have seen many issues with token-based voting, uh, which is kind of very popular uh, nowadays. And, and token-based voting can be manipulated by whales and also can be, uh, and it can even be exploited by hikers. Uh, so yeah, in general, I, I, don't, I don't see a, a good uh, solution right now. But I think for some very limited scenarios or specific use cases, governance can, can still work. Yeah. And uh, in the case of layer one blockchain, uh, which is very complicated and uh, at the same time very critical system, I, I personally believe that the Bitcoin's approach is the best, basically no governance is, is the best, uh, best governance. And, and uh, in the case that if, if, you, if your blockchain has a big community and the community have two different group of people, they uh, don't, don't agree with each other and they want the protocol to go in different directions. I think governance does not really solve the problem because they have different choices. By making a decision with the governance, basically separates the minority rights. Um, so yeah, I think governance does not really uh, help in, in this case, uh, but forking could really help. If there are um, uh, sufficiently big enough people, a big enough group of, of people, they uh, really want the protocol to go in some new direction by introducing some new innovations, they can basically fork the protocol. Um, yeah, this have, has happened in the past. Uh, that's basically my, my point. What's your opinion on this, Jordan? Um, I share a lot of the sentiments that he just expressed there. Um, governance is a really, really a huge topic. Uh, and when I say governance, I'm speaking both of not just of technology, but also of, of people, because ultimately that's all that blockchains are trying to do. They're, find, they're trying to find ways that we can use technology to get everybody to agree with each other in certain ways, or, or at least dis, if they disagree, it's organizing it so that they can they can peacefully disagree in in respective chains. Now, forking is a very important thing, hard forking in particular, uh, because I, in my opinion, this is absolutely necessary for any type of a platform to truly be decentralized. Um, and it's it's a natural it's a natural thing to try different um, to experiment and try different directions. It's a natural for uh, for people to disagree, different teams to disagree with each other. And so if there's any project out there that forbids the ability to actually fork, that is a centralized product. Um, and in my opinion, that is is not really at all something that should even be considered for um, any project that is, is serious about decentralization. Um, but if you want to say in just a, brand, uh, a very broad and general sense, what does the future of governance look like? I think that DAOs in particular do have a role in in that future. Um, definitely, that's one of the best solutions we have today. I don't think that it's by any means the end solution, but um, it's a part of it. That combined with certain things, maybe a proof of authority, meaning that essentially that somebody's your reputation as a, a person, a non-anonymous, not an anonymous person is is actually out there and that you're... you're um, you're using that at, and during your voting is probably another component because ultimately there are there are advantages to remaining anonymous in voting and there's also uh, uh, it's clear advantages to remaining well known into the community in your voting and so these different aspects actually working together I think can really help shape what we'll see in the future of governance. Thank you, Jordan. Like, uh, I, I just want to say to you guys, I see that you're requesting to ask some questions. If you don't mind, uh, I have a few more and then I'll open the floor to everyone, if that's okay with you. Um, Jordan, you opened the door to my next question, which is a tricky one, uh, because it's not something that I've seen that has been, let's say, solved so far. Uh, you're talking about decentralization. So my question is, like, how do you measure 
decentralization? What are the interesting metrics that you think help us define what decentralization is? Is the Nakamoto coefficient or do you have other measures or do you have, um, how do you define a decentralized enough system? Yeah, that, that's a very, very complicated question. And it's one that we've had internally at Nervos too about how do we actually measure this? And it's we've looked at multiple metrics out there and there's some interesting uh, different ways of doing it. But ultimately, when you really get to the nitty gritty, it's such a nuanced topic that any si single metric doesn't really reflect the, the entirety of each individual project. Um, so I, something like the Nakamoto coefficient, like I, I believe that this is a a good starting step, right? This is this is something to to look at, but I have absolutely have problems with that number because it was it was basically written by a Bitcoin maximalist to specifically show one side that they wanted it to show. They they guaranteed their their selves on top. Um whereas like I said, it's it's a complicated subject with a lot of nuance in it. Um, so I don't think that it, that's necessarily a, a single good number to go with, um, but the um, the general direction that they were they were going for um, definitely there's some merit to that. Um, but the general question that you ask, like what is a decentralized enough enough system, that is also a, a multifaceted answer to that. Depends on what your project is. Like for example, there are, there are certain projects. Um, like for example, a game or something doesn't necessarily need the same level of decentralization as a currency, a, a global currency does. It's perfectly fine for it to exist on a just a handful of proof of authority computers. Um, in most cases, that's completely fine. Uh, but something like a currency, which is it is directly tied to the well-being of individuals in the world, um, that is something that is 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 really fundamental to the way that humans operate these days and because of that importance it needs something much stronger so my own personal definition of what does that mean decentralized enough system when you're talking about something like a currency or a financial application and maybe dApps in the future things that are really truly critical um, decentralized enough means that it's able to withstand the uh, a prolonged attack from any central central large party or um, or even a government, any any single or large entity. And I know that that's a very vague answer, but uh, again, this is such a complicated topic that it's it's really difficult to quantify these into actual numbers. It's more just scenarios that you can describe that say this is what would be decentralized enough. Thank you. I like this answer that that raises really the the good questions <laughs> that are the answers to the question. Uh, Cheng, do you want to ask, add something to this answer or should we move to the next question? Um, I, I pretty much agree that it, it's not easy to quantify, uh, but I, I'd like to share, to share my personal pers perspective when, um, when I uh, want to value whether a project is decentralized or not. I only look at two aspects. The first aspect, aspect is uh, uh, the cost to decentralize the network. So here is mostly about the cost to run for nodes and also the cost to run the, the core infrastructures. Uh, Bitcoin is, is the base uh, in this respect, uh, in, in this uh, in, in this part, because the phone is really the most lightweight one. And the infrastructure side, they are basically uh, like no infrastructure is needed to, to run it. Uh, and the uh, Ethereum, on the other hand, is it's not doing great because the most of the DeFi stuff is relying on MetaMask, relying on uh, uh, Infura and the uh, Ether scan. And the, the second the second way I um, I usually use to value uh, a protocol is uh, the cost to decentral uh, the cost to uh, decentralize the ecosystem. So this part is uh, means Mm, is it very easy to onboard the new devs? Is it easy to build the new applications on top of it? Uh, because ultimately, uh, the pro a protocol is very uh, bounded to the its ecosystem. If the ecosystem is kind of controlled by a small group of entities, then it's not really decentralized. Um, so here, 
dev experience, uh, tools, infrastructure, all of this, uh, all of these matters, and uh, uh, it's very important for the future of, of the blockchain. Yeah, that that's basically how I uh, value the decentralization of a protocol in a more kind of a uh, doable way. But it's a, it's a very technical perspective. Thank you, Cheng. I think it's a it's a it's always interesting to have like the clear criteria that someone uh, uses to evaluate something. So I really like it. Uh, and the the next question for me uh, comes inspired by Jameson Lop, who, as you know, is a passionate Bitcoiner. Um, he has written recently a very compelling article on the death of decentralized email. In it, he really shows how convenience and centralization have triumphed of the technical yet decentralized beginnings of email. Um, so I want to make an analogy here and ask you if you think that blockchains such as Nervos and Alephium can result, can, can triumph and, and resist these really centripetal forces of convenience, the it just works and the regulations versus the ideals of decentralization and self-sovereignty. Okay, well, first, I'm going to have to break those two apart. Regulation and convenience are two different topics. And of course, these, just like all of your other questions, these are extremely deep topics on how we're actually going to, to accomplish this. But ultimately, to answer your, your question directly, are we going to triumph over convenience? I think the answer is no. We cannot triumph over convenience. We cannot win by having a, an experience that is unfavorable to users. So we have to make our systems just as convenient. And I, and I see that in the future, things are getting better. We are watching these things slowly but surely evolve into to ways that they will be easier to use. Some of this will be completely self-custody. Some of this in the future will be custodial-based services. That's kind of the way it's going to be. But this is a workable problem. And so the convenience of this, of, of blockchains, will, in my opinion, rival what is out there today in the Web 2.0 world and in the traditional world in many respects. Um, and then we're also competing on cost there. And that's where I, I see that the, the innovations that are coming out today are, are the very beginning, the first step on what's going to be a long climb. But eventually, we're going to surpass the costs of the traditional system, and we're going to have lower costs involved. So it's, it's really uh, going to be a change of, of the tide at some point in which everybody wants to go to the decentralized systems because they're just as convenient and they're actually less expensive in the long run. Now, when you talk about regulation, that is a, another really big topic. Uh, and it's, it's one that it, it actually scares me uh, sometimes because of the way that I see certain entities like the SEC trying to reach out well beyond their, their what should be their scope of interest. Um, but ultimately, blockchains are, are something that are, cannot really truly be stopped. Um, regulation would not stop anything, it would, but it could really slow it down by, by decades. So this is not something that I want to challenge. Um, it's, it's something that I hope and I, and I push for actively that, that regulators will actually see that there, this is technology is something that we need to embrace um, because this is something that is truly something that has never existed in the history of mankind before, a platform that uh, that eliminates the the reliance on each other because we've seen throughout the history of the world that we can't really trust each other so finally we have a system that we can work on even ground this is this is something truly remarkable um and and really a it's something that we need just as a people to continue existing with each other um so anyway that's it's kind of a ph philosophical thing of course but uh, ultimately, regulators, there are good guys out there. These guys don't get the spotlight. When you, when you see on the news, they're of course they're they're focusing on outrage to get people pissed off. But what you got to realize is there are people out there that we should be supporting that have our interests in mind. So that's that's kind of um, my opinion on it is that we need to just make sure that we are diligent and supporting those who do actually support decentralization efforts um, because. Um, this is this is something that if we go to war on this, there is a chance that we, we would lose. And while it wouldn't necessarily shut down projects permanently, it would, it would really set it back 
So let's just continue to make our efforts the best that we can. Amazing answer. I, I, I would almost want to ask you if there's a precedent of um, centralized versus decentralized uh, services or, 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 or tools and that eventually ended up in the decentralized version kind of winning uh, even in the long run. But like maybe, maybe Cheng wants to add something uh, to that uh, answer. Uh, not too much, uh, but I first think the centralized email kind of failed as well because right now about half of the half the e of the emails are actually spamming emails, right? So uh, it's not doing a great job. I think the initial decentralized design failed because it likes of uh, a good uh, incentive design for the system. And if if we do it properly with uh, uh, with blockchain, probably not layer one because layer one probably is is not good enough for um, uh, for emails. But with layer two and with some services on top of layer one, could do that uh, well. And uh, I I think could we could completely solve the spamming issues uh, with proper incent, uh, incentives design. Uh, and regarding convenience. I, I think uh, right now, uh, crypto in general is not really that user friendly because it's, uh, we are still early and the building really takes a lot of time. Uh, yeah, I build, I code every day and uh, I use a lot of stuff. So I, I can definitely say that uh, technical and the infrastructure, infrastructure side, we are still very, very early compared to the uh, Web2 stuff. Uh, it took many years for the web to email system and the other services to to be um, so smooth, so user friendly, and and I, I personally feel like we can do the same thing with uh, for uh, for crypto for blockchain, uh, especially if you uh, imagine a multi-chain uh, future uh, with different chains with different foxes and different design trade-offs. So yeah, convenience. Uh, like user experience, I, I don't see it uh, as a big problem. Uh, it's really a, a matter of time and also a matter of adoption. Uh, and uh, regarding regulation, this is not really something I'm uh, good at because I pretty much focus on building. Uh, I personally feel like it, it's gonna be evolved similar like internet. Uh, at the very beginning of internet, uh, like uh, regulations, uh, uh, did not know how to probably uh, uh, live with uh, uh, with internet, but I think right now still it's kind of uh, a problem. But I think it's much better than like ten or twenty years ago. So I think it's going to be the same for for blockchain and for crypto. Thanks, Cheng. So I I mean I really love these answers. I have two more questions, but then I'm going to open the questions to, to the audience. So you can start requesting if you want to ask a question to Jordan or Cheng. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you, like, okay, let's give a short answer to if you're a dev uh, and, and you want to start um, experimenting uh, the experience of Alephium on Nervous, where do you go? Uh, short question, short answer would be perfect. Yeah, yeah. So the for us, it's it's probably uh, docs.nervos.org, or our second site is actually startwithnervos.com. Uh, it depends on what you actually want to build on. If you want to build on our layer one, then that's docs.nervos.org, or um, startwithnervos.com if you're interested more in just EVM development on our chain. Um, so it's when if you're looking to get started, like this is this is going to be um, absolutely a. a there's, we've actually written a, a recent article by uh, our Travis, who's uh, my coworker, who um, put together what what layer do you actually want to build on, um, it, which is a very heavy topic, but the it's it depends on a lot of the different things because we've we've said like um, with UTXOs are definitely more difficult, but they're they're possibly the future. So anyway, I'd recommend that article. Um, that's he, that's Travis. He's Nervos Ninja. He's actually in the chat room right now, um, and. Um, if you're if you're on EVM for sure, it's it's Godwoken. That's a really easy solution for you. That's the the Ethereum compatible layer. What about you, Cheng or Hong Chao? If you want to build today, where do you go?
Cheng. Ah, okay. I I thought Hong Chao is uh for this. Uh, yeah. So uh, I I think it's similar to uh, Jordan's answer. Uh, right now a good starting point is the website and also the doc. Uh, website is very easy to find, and the doc is docs dot and and the. I think if you are a developer, the best way is to ready to to build something um, and try to, um, for example, build a, a simple D app. Uh, try to uh, play with the SDK. Uh, try to uh, run a full notes and try to run the also the the, the whole stack to see uh, if it's kind of decentralized enough. Uh, yeah, so basically that. And we are still very early. Uh, and there are a lot of things to build. Uh, like almost uh, all of the D5 stuff we're going to build with our uh, virtual machine and our language. Uh, it's a new model with very unique security features. Uh, it's going to be very fun. So yeah, if you are devs, I, I would recommend just to try it and to enjoy it. Thank you, Chang. Um, <laughs> this leads me to my last question that I actually didn't prepare, but like now I want to ask you. Uh, what, what, so you've both been in, in crypto for a long time now. You, you both have like quite an interesting track record. What, what gets you excited now in the morning when you wake up and you want to start building? What, what is it that keeps you, uh, you know, on fire about the space, Jordan? Well, there's, it, it varies from day to day, but ultimately I get excited about just watching so many things be built. It, it reminds me of uh, looking back to the beginning of the internet where back then it, I remember when I first got on the internet, like the, the, the most amazing site was I think Coca-Cola's website, which it, it, it was, it was silly. It was this, uh, this bear character, this animated bear, like sliding down a mountain and there was but that was the best that was available like it, it that was there was very little out there and then over the years we saw so much be built on the internet we watched it change so much and and actually improve the lives of almost everybody on the planet um i i see that same type of potential in, in blockchain it might not be as as apparent it might be something that happens a little bit more behind the scenes over time but this is this is something that eventually everybody on, on the planet might have a chance to be actually using this technology. And when they go into the store, they're not going to go into the store and say, hey, can I pay with Bitcoin? They're probably just going to say, hey, can I pay with my cell phone? It's going to be built in just like Apple Pay or something else. And it will be one of those one of those the main currencies out there. Um, it will be a Bitcoin or Ethereum or Nervos or Alethium, it's like one of these things will be out there and maybe it'll be all of them that are out there. Maybe maybe you actually walk into a store and you don't say, can I pay with, with um, Bitcoin? You actually say, can I just pay with crypto? And uh, you'll pay with whatever you want and the, the recipient, the shop owner will receive whatever they want and it'll just be instantly exchanged. I mean, there's so much potential here on, on what happens here. There's so much potential for collaboration with decentralized systems, which are truly... Um, the only way that many corporations would ever see in a way a way to collaborate on a platform. Um, something like, for example, video games is a good one because there's multiple different platforms out there and all these big companies, these big publishers are in competition with each other. There's no way that they're ever going to collaborate on the, the opponent's platform. But if there's a, a single platform that is decentralized, all of a sudden that type, that type of collaboration becomes becomes possible again because they can actually move to something that is guaranteed to be neutral. So, I mean, I, this is this is what gets me up in the morning, right? This is what I see out there. I just see so much potential. I see the innovation that that continues to happen and just surprises me. Like more most recently it was NFTs with artists getting out there, thousands and thousands of artists and being able to finally monetize their work in new ways. Just it's like I never saw that coming. Coming, uh, it is something that I actively at the very beginning I didn't think it was going to catch on, and then all of a sudden this gigantic boom, all of these artists out here, and so many of them are absolutely fantastic. It's just it, it excites me because I don't know what's next. 
Like this, you can only see so far and the next big innovation is still to come. Well, what a passionate answer. I love it. And I, I really concur on, in most of the sentiment here. Uh, Cheng and Hong Shao, like, let, let's start with Cheng. Like what, what gets you up in the morning? Um, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with Jordan. Uh, crypto and uh, uh, blockchain decentralized technology has a huge potential. Uh, one of the uh, one of the most uh, exciting part for me, I think, is uh, improve the freedom of the world. Uh, in general, I treat freedom as options. Uh, when when people have more options, usually they are more freedom. So. Uh, bridge, uh, blockchain and the crypto gives people more options when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to finance. Uh, right now, with the traditional finance system, I, I think like <laughs> we are not sure what's going to happen with people's assets. Like um, if Fed uh, announce something new in the next week, probably the the stock price is going to uh, change a lot just because of the announcement. Uh, uh, I, I personally think that kind of system is a bit weird for me. Uh, and with blockchain and uh, with crypto, uh, we're going to have different uh, options. Uh, that's the, the first part. The second part is uh, because crypto and the blockchain is still very, very early and there are a lot of things to build. I, I basically like every day I have a lot of things and a lot of new ideas in mind to I, I want to work on them. I I only wish that I could work in parallel, and you know I have several brands, several uh, several brands to 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 program me in parallel. Uh, yeah, so that's also that's one of the big reasons. Like we can build a lot of things uh, in such a young and uh, potential industry. Thank you, Cheng. So uh, same question for Hongsha. What 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 what? what drives you up when you wake up in the morning and and just so the others can if you have questions you can start requesting uh by clicking on the on yourself um so hong cha what gets you up in the morning uh i very much uh echo chance point about uh, options uh it's very important to have alternatives and i think crypto and blockchain provides uh alternatives to the the, the current um, system that's that's uh, one of the most important reasons why, yeah, I am interested in this uh, space, and also it's extremely like th this space is very like multidisciplinary and uh, like it um, serves like a like almost like a driving force for you to learn so many different kind of things, and that's I find very fascinating as well. So yeah, that's that's the major reasons. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to open the floor. So if anyone here has a question, now is the time. Otherwise, I'm going to free our speakers because we've already passed the time. So Seto has a question. Let me make him speaker. There you go, Set. You have to unmute yourself, though. Hi, um, I'm Seto. And... Um... I'm a bit curious about this uh, selfish mining uh, you mentioned. Could you could you explain a little bit uh, what it is and how and how do you how do you address the risk? Okay, well, I can answer that um, on a very uh, high level, which is so selfish mining is is a process where a miner um, doesn't actually share the the block that they've they've or they manipulate the transmission of the block the winning block so that they have an advantage over others um there's actually a couple different ways that it's done but it's it, it's it basically refers to cheating in the system um now i i don't actually see in this as as something that should be like like for example if these were not decentralized system you would say is should this be illegal i actually don't see it that way i see it as an, an inherent flaw which is in um, some of the early implementations of proof of work, uh, which is why Nervos changed theirs around specifically to to make this to de-incentivize this process, um, because you're supposed to ultimately 
um, with mining, it's it's to decentralize the the pools. You don't actually know who's going to win, but if somebody uses specific techniques with selfish mining, they can actually gain an advantage where they gain um, additional rewards that they were not supposed to 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 uh, to get. So um, yeah, I mean that's that's the reason why uh, Nervos created NC Max um, and specifically included a two step feature in there because it, it alleviates that by aiding the, the block block propagation by separating transmission from actually confirmation. Um, and uh, there's a paper out there of, uh, on our website nervos.org if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, but um, yeah, that's the basics of selfish mining is it's it's kind of like cheating within mining. Thank you very much. Thanks. Is there any other question uh, for our, our host today? Otherwise, I'm going to close this because we've extended the time already quite some. Uh, so I'll, I'll start the conclusion. Uh, thanks a lot, Jordan. It's been a really awesome experience to have you on. Like um, Personally, I've really enjoyed the clarity of your explanations and uh, the strength of your first principle um, talk uh, and also the technicality of it is it's quite a very interesting mix that we love uh, at LFM and also that I love personally in general. Uh, thanks Cheng and uh, Hong Chao for participating uh, for Halefium. Uh, we love to have these discussions with uh, blockchains with which we share things. We think this Dialogue is crucial and interesting and leads to better outcomes for everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed your time here, Jordan, <laughs> and that we can do this again someday. Um, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is this is great. And um, yeah, I'm always always happy to collaborate again in the future. And for anybody who's curious, like how did this actually start? This is all part of the uh, UTXO alliance is, is how we got introduced. And so uh, the, anybody who's from the Nervos ecosystem, they know I speak very highly of that. Uh, that's a collaboration between all the UTXO chains. And yeah, I look forward to more of these types of things in the future. Yeah, this is great. We've, we've had all, already like a few discussions with Ergo, we, with them. Um... With a, with a, and we're going to probably talk with some others. So like the UTX Alliance is a, is a perfect uh, a perfect association in which we are very involved and we think it has a, a great future, actually. Uh, lots of work, though. So thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, Cheng, do you want to say something else? Or I can conclude the session for today. All right, no, that's all. Thank you for the great host. As always. Thank you. Thanks, Hong Chao, also for taking the time and to everyone for listening. Uh, we'll do more of this because obviously it's a very nice exercise and uh, we're lucky to have such amazing hosts. So uh, thank you, uh, guest. Uh, that's not what I meant. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to close this now. Have a good uh, day or evening, depending where you are.